<laughs> Six days ago, a Facebook video caught my eye portraying the turmoil of a European or American civil war featuring a second-by-second -second accounting of the moments of a five-year-old girl's experience. It begins with her happy and smiling as she celebrates her birthday with her family. Slowly, her life unravels into violence and chaos. She flees her home in panic amidst gunfire. Her father is left behind, trapped within an army checkpoint as he reaches his arms through a chain link fence. The daughter and mother are pale, dirty, and emaciated, weary in their search for any rotted food. Eventually, these two come to a military-led refugee camp where celebrating her birthday one year later is without joy. Though this video was a reenactment of war refugees from a Western lens, such is the situation of too many who are trying to escape their war-ravaged cities in Syria. Over 13 million Syrians have fled their homes since the outbreak of war. Imagine all of us who reside in Michigan, which is over 9 million of us in fact, searching for someplace else for safety. Will Ohio, Indiana, or Minnesota take us? These Americans know our language, and many are Christian, but what about the Syrians? Who will welcome them? Without visas, and without countries to accept these immigrants, these fathers and mothers, daughters and sons, grandmas and grandpas wander endlessly in a world that does not work, one in which global perspectives are not existent. Beyond stories and images which haunt us, violence is the residue. In this moment, more than 500,000 people have been killed from the Civil War, 14,000 of which are children. Survivors have lost loved ones, suffered injuries, and witnessed unspeakable brutality. They are forced into combat as fighters, used as human shields, and otherwise are exploited. The country suffers collapsing infrastructure, health care, and education systems, and because Syria is the core of the Middle East, its collapse could easily spill conflict into neighboring regions, giving terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda an opportunity to assume control. We can ask ourselves who is responsible for the violence, but what is more important to ask is who is responsible for the survivors. We must remember we are in America, land of the free and home of the brave, where the Statue of Liberty, the most iconic symbol of American freedom, reads these words written by Emma Lazarus. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore, Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Thank you. Questions? Okay. If you had to pick any animal to be your superhero sidekick, what would it be and why? <laughs> <laughs> I'm partial to elephants for several reasons. One is that they are, to me, a symbol of strength and resilience. Um, also that they have kind of a pack mentality. Um, they roam with their family for life. And um, they also have brilliant memories, which I think would be very useful to have. <laughs> I'm going to challenge you on this. I'm ready. If, a, if a train leaves San Francisco <laughs> at 4 p.m. headed towards L.A. at 80 miles an hour, what has been your greatest leadership challenge you've overcome, <laughs> and what did you learn from it? <laughs> what has been my greatest leadership challenge, and how have I overcome it? And what did you learn from it? And what did I learn from it? My biggest leadership challenge um, has to be taking like the initial step to know that you know you are good enough. I was in the back row of my Phi Theta Kappa orientation, and I thought, you know, they just look so great up there, but that could never be me. You know, who am I? And I took the small step to do something that terrified me, and I became an officer. And it ended up being one of the most impactful experiences of my entire life. Um, I've learned doing something that terrifies you is what's going to grow you as a person. And it's necessary, and especially for leadership development. You just got to do what terrifies you. And 
have fun with it. <laughs> Instead of a sidekick, if you had to pick a piece of fruit or vegetable to represent you, what would it be and why? <laughs> Who makes these questions? <laughs> a fruit or vegetable to represent me and yep. why? For some reason, I'm thinking of pineapples. Um, and I think because of that, pineapples are sweet, but still kind of tangy. They got a little kick to them. <laughs> they are unconventional in a way, you know, in appearance, but inside they are amazing. And who lives in a pineapple under the sea? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, sorry to make it a little heavy, but what would someone who doesn't like you uh, tell us about you? <laughs> this is a hard one for me because one of my biggest values is I want people to like me. And in all of my interactions, I strive to be a person that makes people feel comfortable and welcomed and to know that someone doesn't like me is like heartbreaking. I want to fix it. I'm a fixer. So someone who doesn't like me would probably say that perhaps I care too much about what other people think. Um, they might say that I... Care too much, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, what is the most significant goal you would like to accomplish as a regional officer? That would definitely be um, I want to increase awareness about Phi Theta Kappa, and if you come to my campaign table, you will see my strategy for that, um, and also increase the strengths of our chapters. My idea is to do um, a survey um, analyzing the strengths and weaknesses of each individual chapter and then offering chapters their own resources in order to overcome their weaknesses and turn them into strengths. Um, I think that customized resources for each individual chapter is very important because all chapters are different. Um, so it would definitely be to increase awareness about Phi Theta Kappa and strengthen individual regions in order to strengthen the region as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much.